You know, rarely does life go as we have planned it. The unexpected always seems to happen. And oftentimes, the unexpected is anything but pleasant. We lose our jobs, we lose our health, we lose loved ones. Horrible things tend to happen in life. We face daily obstacles. We endure hardships and sufferings of all sorts. This happens for all of us to some degree or another. There is no such thing as someone who lives a life that is free from pain and struggles. All of us face things that are unpleasant, unexpected events in our day-to-day -day lives. Even being a believer in Jesus Christ does not change this reality. As believers, we face pretty much every trial and hardship that unbelievers face. The difference is not in the circumstances that we face, but in how we respond to those situations and the hope that we have as believers. For as believers in Jesus Christ, we know that this world is not all there is. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, the one who is on the throne. We know that one day he is returning and one day he will make all the wrongs right. We know we have been forgiven. We know that we have been bought with his blood. And we know that we are guaranteed a future with him. Even knowing all of these realities, sometimes it's difficult to keep going on. But it's knowing those realities that allow us to persevere and to endure when everything is crumbling around us. But even though we know these things to be true in the midst of our suffering, sometimes we can lose perspective and we can become overwhelmed by our circumstances. Many a godly person, when facing struggles and trials, have been overcome with depression and anxiety. We're reminded of that in 1 Kings 19, when the prophet Elijah was so overcome with the emotional strain and stress upon him in his ministry that he gave up and he just wanted to die. But the Lord came to him and ministered to him and strengthened him, helped him to gain the right perspective on life so that he could pick up and keep going on. And that's exactly what each of us needs in times of suffering. We need to be reminded of how to view circumstances not from our limited perspective, but from God's eternal perspective. And that's what we're going to be seeing in our passage this morning. How to view our lives with an eternal perspective. And when we are able to do that, then we are able to face the struggles and the hardships of life and endure as we should. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 8. As we continue on our study, we pick up what we left off last week with verse 17. Romans 8 is such a precious chapter. It starts with the promise that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The reality is, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have been set free from slavery to sin. We have been set free from the eter eternal penalty for our sin. And we have been set free from the power of sin in our daily lives. Paul has been expanding upon the wonder of this reality in the verses that follow verse 1. Reminding us as believers that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And as those who belong to Him, we are children of God. We saw last week the amazing reality that every believer has been adopted. We are sons of God, and we are forever in His family as a result of that relationship. This reality that we are His children forms the basis for what Paul just now declares. And as we begin this morning, we see the wonder that we as believers, we are actually heirs of God. We'll start with verse 16 as the sentence actually begins there, even though we covered it last week. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We are told very clearly here that to be a believer in Jesus Christ is to be a child of God. Paul has already established that we are adopted as sons of God the moment we put our faith in Him. We noted last time that according to Roman law, to be adopted formed a permanent bond between the one who was adopted and their new family. It was a bond that could never be broken. Paul now builds upon that reality that we are God's children. And he points out that as God's children, that makes us his heirs. And we are not only his heirs, but we are co-heirs with Christ. Normally when we think of being an heir, we focus on the inheritance to come in the future at some point in our life. And certainly there is an aspect of being an heir that is involved in that. And Paul will focus on that in just a minute at the end of verse 17 and verse 18. But there's also an aspect of being an heir that affects us each and every day in the present. To be an heir is not just about what we will get one day in the future. It's about whose name we bear 
in the present. So this is about reminding us not only of our future, but who it is that we are today. As believers, we are heirs of God. That means we are sons of the Most High God, and our family name is, in fact, His name. We represent our Heavenly Father in everything we do. We bear His name as believers. And that reality ought to impact the decisions we make. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We should notice that this status of being His heir is not a reward. It's not something we earn. It's not something we strive for. This is a description, a declaration of who we already are as believers. If we are a child of God, then we are an heir of God. Most often in Roman culture, the inheritance would be evenly split amongst the heirs. But even at that, each heir would only get a fraction of the entire estate. But our spiritual inheritance is not like that. It's not like the Lord has an estate worth a million dollars and every believer is going to get a few pennies when it all gets split up. In God's realm, every heir receives the entire inheritance as if we were the only heir that he had. Every child of God receives the full inheritance from the Father without exceptions and without limit. There is no child of God who is less or more of an heir than another. There is none who receives more. There is none who receives less. No matter what we do or don't do as believers, we are equal heirs of God by His amazing grace. We are also described as fellow heirs with Christ. That word in the Greek is a single word. It's sunkleronamas. It means one who is a co-heir in receiving an unearned gift. One who receives a possession together with someone else. It describes someone who is a fellow receiver. The idea of this word is that both individuals receive the same gift. It's not different gifts. It's not similar gifts. It's not different amounts. It's the same gift. And wonder of wonders, we are told here that we will get the same inheritance as Christ and the same inheritance along with every other believer. We are promised to receive that which the Son of God Himself is promised to receive. <coughs> Now please notice, this does not mean that we will become gods. We are never the equals of Christ. He is the eternal God. He has always been God. He always will be God. We are always created creatures, and we will always remain created creatures. We never even get close to being His equal. That's not what this is talking about. He does not inherit His deity. He is deity, and He always will be. But we are promised to receive the same inheritance that Christ has been promised. And the best way to understand this is to look at what the New Testament says that Christ will inherit. We see this in Hebrews 1-2. In these last days, He has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. We are told very clearly here that Jesus is the heir of all things. That is a very all-inclusive statement. Nothing is left out. Jesus is the one who is the heir of all things. Everything in creation belongs to him. He will inherit it all, and he will one day rule over it all. There is nothing that will not come under his rule and authority and dominion. We're reminded of that in Philippians 2, starting in verse 10. For this reason also God highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that Jesus has been promised. He will rule and reign over the world and over the entire universe. That is His inheritance as Messiah, the eternal Son of God. He will reign over His kingdom from Jerusalem for a thousand years on this earth. And then when the new heavens and the new earth come, He will reign forevermore without end. This is the inheritance that is guaranteed and promised to the Messiah throughout the pages of Scripture. And the amazing thing is, as fellow heirs, we believers will receive all that He receives. We will one day rule over creation with Christ. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with Him. We will reign with Christ. That is part of our future inheritance as co-heirs of His. We will inherit the kingdom of God even as He does. As believers, we will be resurrected. We will be given new bodies, bodies that are like the Lord's. We will reign over the earth for a thousand years with Him. 
Not because we deserve it, not because we did something really noteworthy, but simply because we are his children, simply because we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And as he has promised to reign, so we will reign with him. We will be given a relationship with the Lord that will never end. Look what the Lord declares in Revelation 21.7. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is said by the Lord after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Overcomers is a phrase that is used throughout the book of Revelation to describe believers. So then believers are here promised to inherit all these things. All these things is referencing the new heavens and the new earth that are described in the first six verses of Revelation 21. We are told, we are promised that as believers we will inherit all the wonders of the new heavens and the new earth. We will inherit a universe that is without pain that is without tears, that is without heartache. We will inherit a world in which sin does not exist. And all we know is a joyous, unhindered fellowship and relationship with our God and with other believers. This is our guaranteed future as believers. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then heaven is your guaranteed inheritance by the promise of His Word. And we know that the Lord always keeps His word. And so we can have absolute confidence that this is, in fact, our future. Notice the second part of this promise. I will be His God and He will be my Son. That can be a little confusing at first glance because of the future tense that is used. And we know that the Lord is already our God today as believers. According to Romans, we've already seen that we have been adopted as His sons at the moment we came to faith. This promise does not diminish our current relationship with the Lord at all. Rather, it's an affirmation that our relationship that begins on earth will continue in that way throughout all eternity. We will continue to have a personal relationship with our Creator forever. We will not lose our personalities into a vast oneness. We will not become one with the universe or become equal to God. He forever remains God. We forever remain His children. We will exist forever in a personal relationship with Him. We will be His children for all eternity. The relationship that begins on earth never ends. As believers in Jesus Christ, this is our future. This is a promise of what awaits us. We will forever enjoy His presence. We will forever remain as His children. What a wonderful inheritance awaits us as heirs. But the reality is this future only applies if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. But if you are here and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then this is not your future. Only the sons of God will inherit the kingdom of God. All others will go to a very different place. And if you would like to know more about how it is that you can put your faith in Jesus Christ and be one of His sons, please see me after the service. As believers, we are heirs of God and we are fellow heirs with Christ. That has incredible significance and meaning to our daily lives. It means that all that the Father has promised to the Son, He has promised to us. It reminds us that as the Father loves the Son, so He loves us, for we are His children. The unselfish and amazing love that exists between God the Father and God the Son is showered upon us as His children. His love is unconditional. It is never-ending. It is without limits. There is nothing we could do that would ever cause the Lord to stop loving us or love us less than He already does. There is nothing we can do to change His commitment to us. And He has declared to each and every believer, I love you. I have adopted you as my child. You are my heir. You are a co-heir with Christ. And that is an amazing truth. You know, many times we are motivated in life to protect our own family name. We don't want to bring dishonor to our earthly family, and so we will try to do things that brings honor to our family name. How much more should we be motivated to live righteously as we realize the reality is we are sons of God? How much more should we be concerned that we live in a way that gives honor and praise to the one who has done so much for us? This reality ought to be impacting every decision we make. As believers, we can look forward to our inheritance for we know that it is secure. There is nothing anyone can do to take away the future that awaits us. And so that gives us hope, even in the darkest of circumstances. For we know that no matter how dark and dreary things get on earth, our inheritance is awaiting for us, and that is the promise of God's Word. 
There's a second truth for us to realize to keep the right perspective in times of suffering. And that is, as believers, we will be glorified. Look at, verse, at the end of verse 17. If indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. This is another first-class conditional sentence. This is a grammatical structure we've seen Paul using throughout chapter 8. The word if does not imply doubt or possibility here, but really certainty. It could be translated as since. Since we suffer, we will be glorified. This is not about earning our glorification through our suffering. This does not mean that glorification is only available to those who earn it through severe suffering on earth. Rather, Paul is simply declaring, as believers, we will suffer with Him. That is guaranteed. That is just a fact of life. We will suffer with Him. And it is suffering that assures us that we will be glorified with Him as well. Because there is no Christian life apart from suffering with Christ. And the goal, the end result of our suffering as believers is that our suffering will one day end in our glorification with Him. See, the Bible explains suffering is not something that's rare. It's not something that is only for really, really bad people. It's something that we all go through. Suffer is the Greek word sumpasko here. It means to experience pain jointly or to undergo the same type of suffering that another does. To suffer with Christ does not mean that we must suffer exactly as He suffered. It does not mean that we must all be crucified or bear the weight of sin's punishment ourselves. Those are sufferings that He paid once for all, never to be paid again. We don't have to suffer the penalty for our sins. Thankfully, Christ already paid for that in full. Many of you are aware there are a group of people in the Philippines who every year physically crucify themselves trying to suffer with Christ. That is not what this verse is talking about at all. We should never be literally crucifying ourselves or anything like that. Christ paid the price for our sin once for all so we would never have to pay it. And to suffer with Him is not talking about trying to emulate the physical sufferings that Christ did. So what does it mean to suffer with Christ? Well, it means to suffer in a similar fashion as Christ did or to face the same type of sufferings that He faced when He was on earth. Now, we could spend all morning on this concept alone, but I want to just highlight a few ways in which we as believers suffer with Christ. The first way is that we may suffer persecution for our faith. Certainly, as we read the gospel, we see Jesus suffered for His message. He spoke the truth. He proclaimed the message that men were sinners, bound for hell unless they repented and put their faith in Him. And because of that, men hated Him. They persecuted Him. They eventually put Him on a cross. The religious leaders did not welcome Jesus. They wanted Him dead. They tried to kill Him several times before He allowed it to take place in Jerusalem upon the cross. They picked up stones and tried to stone Him to death several times. Why? Because they hated Him for the message that He was preaching. So today, when believers experience persecution for following Jesus, we are sharing in His sufferings because we are suffering in the same way that He did. Those around the world who even this very morning are physically attacked, are being thrown into prison, are being even murdered for their faith, they are sharing in His sufferings. Those who lose jobs, who lose friends or family members for their faith, they are sharing in His sufferings. This is something we ought to expect to come into our lives. For when we walk as Jesus walked, we should expect that the world will treat us as it treated Him. Jesus said as much in John 15, 20. He said, Remember the word I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Persecution for walking as Jesus walked is sharing in His sufferings, and it's a suffering that many have known. A second way we suffer as with Christ is when we suffer for resisting temptation. What we see as we read through the Gospels that Christ suffered throughout His time on earth as He resisted the temptation to sin. He suffered the daily pressure to take the easy way out and to do evil. The enemy came and tempted Him in the wilderness, and Christ suffered as He was being tempted. But it's not like he was only tempted three times and then he, that was it for the rest of his life. He faced temptation on a daily basis as the enemy continued to tempt him to get to do evil. He suffered in the garden as he faced temptation to not do that which the Father 
had desired, to avoid the cross and to find another way. We suffer as Christ when we resist temptation in our daily lives. And the emotional turmoil that we faced as we resist temptation is sharing in the sufferings of Christ. In fact, it's yet another indication that we belong to Him. Because unbelievers don't experience this particular type of persecution and suffering. They give in to temptation. They live for the flesh. They don't suffer in this manner. But as believers, we seek to always resist temptation. We seek to obey the Lord and to live for Him. And when we do that, we will experience suffering. To say no to sin is to suffer with Christ. There's a third way that we suffer with Christ. And that is when we suffer emotional pain. For example, we see that Jesus suffered emotionally at the death of his friend Lazarus. He wept. He suffered emotionally as he looked at the spiritual lostness of Jerusalem and he realized how many were on their way to hell. It caused him great anguish in his soul. Our emotional connection to others, our ability to feel pain when others suffer, our ability to grieve at the loss of a loved one, they are all ways in which we share in the sufferings of Christ as we are pained by sin's results and the consequences others suffer. The reality is we are living in an imperfect world, one that is tainted by sin, and it brings sorrow. We should never expect that we are to be happy-go-lucky every moment of every day. Certainly, our Lord was not. He suffered deep emotional strain and pain because He loved others deeply. And when we love others, it brings pain and suffering into our life. When we truly love as Jesus loves, we suffer when others suffer, for that is what we see Jesus did. We will grieve when we are separated from those he lo we love, even as we see Jesus was. These types of sufferings are sharing in the sufferings of the Messiah, for they are all the ways we see that he suffered while he was on earth. Sharing in his suffering is not just about being persecuted for our faith. It's about every suffering we endure as we seek to live for him. It's about the suffering we endure as we walk on an earth that is under the curse of sin. But our hope is that when we suffer like Christ suffered, as we experience the similar types of things that our master experienced, it's proof that we belong to him. And we will also one day be glorified with him. So our connection to the Lord is not just sharing in the sufferings. We will also share with him in the eternal glorification that's yet to come. And as we realize the reality of that truth, that we will one day be glorified, it changes everything. To be glorified with him, that phrase is a translation of a single Greek word, sundaxadzo. It means to be exalted, to be glorified, to be honored together with another. This concept of sharing in the glory and in the honor that belongs to Jesus is an absolutely astounding truth in the scripture. As children of God, we inherit that which Christ inherits. We share in his sufferings today and we will share in his glorification yet to come. The glory that belongs to the eternal Son of God, we will get a part of that. To be glorified with Him means that we will have a resurrected body as He does. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We will have glorified bodies that are untainted by sin, that are perfect in every way. We will be those who radiate the glory of God, for we will be those who are without sin and who are pure. That is an incredible promise, the future that awaits for us as believers. And knowing the reality of that should cause us to rejoice. In fact, that's what we read in 1 Peter 4.13. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. As we share in His sufferings, we can rejoice knowing that we will also one day share in His glory. That's why this is so comforting. Not because we somehow take joy in the suffering itself, but because we realize that suffering like Christ, it's a reminder that we belong to Him. When we suffer persecution for our faith, it's evidence we belong to Him. When we suffer facing temptation, confirmation, we belong to Him. When we suffer emotional pain, loving someone the way that Christ loves them, it's confirmation that we do in fact belong to Him. And when we belong to Him, we know that we will be glorified. And that is reason to rejoice. The sufferings we are experiencing is proof that one day we will be glorified. And that's why we can rejoice, even in the midst of heartache, because we remember what it is that lies before us. 
There is joy, there is glory, there is peace awaiting us. And as believers, we are to keep our eyes focused on what is coming. Verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. I consider is the Greek word logizomai. It means to reckon based on careful consideration, to hold a specific opinion. Paul says he has this view on life, his way of viewing every circumstance. His way of thinking is to reckon that the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed. Sufferings is the word pathema. It means to suffer. Specifically, it means to be in pain. The word can be used to describe physical pain or emotional pain or spiritual pain. It's a general word that encompasses suffering of all types, regardless of the reason. Paul is here referring to every conceivable type of suffering that he endures, whether it be hunger or thirst or financial need or physical hardship or emotional pain. Every type of pain and suffering is included and referred to by this word. The phrase not worthy to be compared is a translation of a single Greek word, oxios. It means deserving, that what is comparable degree of worth or merit. Paul says the future glory that will one day be revealed to us is so incredibly amazing that the suffering in the present is nothing in light of what is coming. Now, that does not mean that our suffering today isn't painful, for it is. It does not deny or belittle the reality of the heartache we feel today. It doesn't mean we just shrug off our pain and ignore it as if it's not really there. Rather, Paul is sharing his perspective and it is the biblical perspective, the eternal perspective on life. As he kept his eyes focused on the glory to one day be revealed in him, he could look at his current sufferings, he could look at his pain and his agony, and in light of what was coming, he said, it's not even worth my mentioning it. Because what is coming is so amazing, all else pales in comparison. Paul would say something similar in 2 Corinthians 4. He said this, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an internal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. As we look at these two passages, we learn how it is that Paul could consider his present sufferings as only light and momentary. It's because he had a focus on what was coming in the future. He had his eyes on the glory that is to come. And we must come to realize the same, that our suffering in life is only temporary. No matter how severe the pain is that we are dealing with, it will end one day. Now, there are some things we suffer with our entire life on earth, but that ends when our time on earth is over. But the wonder and the reality is, as believers, we know that when life on earth is over, life is not over for us. That is not the end of our existence. We will live for all eternity. And so Paul is saying, in light of all eternity, what is suffering for even a hundred years on earth? In light of our entire existence, the suffering we endure on earth is virtually insignificant compared to what lies ahead of us. And that is learning to have the eternal perspective, to put things in the internal viewpoint. Children oftentimes think that their suffering is all-consuming and it will never end. Tell a child they can't go do something they want to do. Go to the playground, watch TV. And oftentimes they can feel as if the world has come crashing down and their suffering is so immense, it will never end. They can't see beyond the circumstances of the immediate, and so their suffering seems unbearable. As adults, we look at the situation and to get a grip. We're only talking about a few hours. It's not that big a deal in light of your whole lifespan. But from the child's perspective, the pain is serious, and it seems as if it will never end. In many ways, sometimes in our life, we can be like children in our perspective of our own suffering. It can be real, it can be painful, it can be heartbreaking. But if we can gain a different perspective, if we can look at it from the eternal per perspective, if we can get the bigger picture, 
then we can begin to feel differently about our suffering. Then we can begin to view, view our suffering as Paul viewed his, as momentary light of fiction, not even something worthy to be compared to what is coming. Everything has to do with perspective. And Paul is reminding us, if we can keep our eyes on eternity, if we can keep our eyes on the glory that awaits us in the future, then the suffering we face today will in fact seem as momentary light affliction. Things not even worthy to be compared with that which is waiting for us. Not because they aren't really painful, but because we realize that in light of our eternal existence, in light of the glory that awaits us, this really is light affliction, no matter how hard the situation might be. The glory that awaits us is the reality that we will be transformed to be like Jesus. We will reign with Him for all eternity. We will live in His presence. We will live without sin. We will live without pain or heartache. And keeping our eyes on this truth is what makes our suffering in the present seem but as momentary light affliction. Knowing that this too will pass, no matter how severe, no matter how painful, is what allows us to keep pressing on. Knowing one day the reality is we will be glorified. That's the key to enduring every hardship that we face. Now clearly it is much easier to say it, much easier to preach it, than it is to actually live this way. But Paul was not just preaching these words in a vacuum. He was proclaiming what he had been living out every day of his life. 2 Corinthians 11, he gives a list of some of the hardships and sufferings he had faced in his life. And these are the things that he considered as momentary light afflictions. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. He begins, he is defending his apostleship. He says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more so. And now he goes on to speak of his momentary light afflictions. And far more labors, and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and the Father of Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever, knows I am not lying. Now, by any standard, what Paul went through was incredibly harsh conditions. They were severe sufferings. Now, I know many of us have faced some severe trials and hardships in our life, but I think it's a fair bet to say that few of us have ever experienced the wide variety and intensity of sufferings that Paul endured. And yet, even as he was facing all these various forms of suffering, he could say they are nothing in light of what is coming. He could say that because he kept his eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory to come. And that is to be our perspective on life as well. We are to keep our eyes on the goal that lies ahead of us, our glorification with Him. And when we keep our eyes focused on that which is coming, then our suffering today will pale in comparison to what is coming. We've all heard the saying, I cried for not having shoes until I met a man with no legs. Right? And the idea of that statement is there's always someone who is worse off than us. And so knowing that is supposed to help us not feel so bad about our own suffering. Honestly, that's the best the world has to offer when it comes to how to deal with suffering. They have no hope of a better tomorrow. All they can do is try to feel better that they're better off than someone else. But that's not real hope. And that's not what the Bible tells us at all. It does not teach us to endure our suffering thankful that it's not worse than it is. Rather, we are called to endure our suffering realizing that what is ahead of us is so valuable, so astoundingly amazing, that the temporary sufferings we face on earth, it's worth it. That all we endure on our time on earth can't even begin to compare to the riches that await us for all eternity as sons of glory and sons of God. We need to simply keep our eyes on what is coming. Realizing that suffering is a part of our existence, but it is only temporary. 
And as we do that, then we can begin to consider it all as momentary light affliction. Things not worthy to be compared to what awaits us for all eternity. The key is to keep our eyes on all that God has promised for us in the future. And that provides the strength to endure the hardships that we face. As believers, we are heirs of God. We've been promised the inheritance of His kingdom. We have been blessed with a relationship with Him, and that relationship will never end. We will be glorified for all eternity. We will be without sin, given bodies without blemish, without limitation. And that's what we are to keep our minds focused on. For as we do, it allows us to have an eternal perspective on our life. Whatever suffering you might be facing today, remember who you are in Christ. Remember what your future is by what He has guaranteed. Remind yourself that you belong to the Lord and He will glorify you one day. Remind yourself that everything in this world is fading away quickly. It's but a blink in the light of all eternity. And so we can endure this momentary light affliction as we keep our eyes on the glory that awaits us. Let us pray.